Alrighty, folks, time for another lesson in Canadian politics with the FRM. So last time around we discussed the way that the federal government works. Uh, this time we're going to go down a step and talk provincial politics. So we're going to look at how different provincial governments are broken down, uh, the makeup of provincial governments, the differences and similarities between the federal government and provincial government, how the Queen is represented in provincial politics, because she's involved in everything we do, uh, how the separation of powers between the different levels of government work, um, and once again, in the interest of clarity, I'll refer to the federal government generally as the feds. Uh, the provincial government is either regional or provincial government interchangeably, uh, though strictly speaking, regional is the correct term when being inclusive of the territories. Uh, and Her Majesty the Queen of England as the Queen. And this time I'll try to refrain from Queenie, but no promises. Uh, with those all defined, uh, let's get rolling on the regional government of Canada. All right, so as we go through, uh, it's important to note uh, a couple things. There's basically three levels of government in Canada. There's the federal government, which we've discussed at length in the previous video. Uh, there's regional governments, which we're going to discuss here today, and local governments, which basically refer to municipalities and that sort of thing. Uh, there's ten proper provincial governments in Canada, one for each province in Canada, obviously. Uh, those being British Columbia, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland, and Labrador, uh, home of Screech, by the way, the best rum you will ever drink in your entire life, uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. Uh, each province has a House of Assembly, which is, in essence, like a provincial House of Commons, uh, made up of a number of MPPs, or members of provincial parliament. Uh, they're proportionate to the populations of the area, but for the sake of precision, we'll name them all out here. So Quebec has 125. Ontario has 107, Alberta has 87, British Columbia has 85, Saskatchewan has 58, Manitoba has 57, New Brunswick has 55, Nova Scotia has 52, Newfoundland and Labrador have 48, PEI have 27, and each of the territories have 19. All right, so each member of provincial parliament is elected in a first-past-the-post fashion. That is to say, whoever has the most votes wins the seats, period. Uh, the party, which has the most seats, again, not necessarily the majority, just the most, is given the mandate to lead by the province. So much like in federal politics, where we don't directly vote for the prime minister, us Canucks don't vote for the head of our provinces directly either. Uh, what happens is the head of the party, who has to be a sitting MPP, uh, that wins the most seats in the province, is made premier of the province. And the premier is basically chief muckety-muck of the province, and depending on whether or not they have a majority government, uh, that is to say has more than half the seats of his party in the House of Assembly, uh, or a minority government has more seats than any other one party, but not the majority, uh, will determine whether or not he'll be able to push through legislation with the ease that Donkey Kong can huck a barrel, um, or have to fight for every inch of political ground gained. Uh, the parties are pretty much the same. Uh, there's the Liberals and Progressive Conservatives, with our cons or which are provincial, uh, the NDP, which are provincial, and just like you would expect, uh, some smaller province-only parties, including the Wild Rose Party, uh, and Alberta Party in Alberta, the Saskatchewan Party in, uh, well, Saskatchewan, and the Party Quebecois in Quebec. In any case, regardless of which party wins, uh, they need to quickly get on with the business of running the government after the election. Uh, and much like their counterpart in the feds, the Premier's first order of business is to appoint ministers to all the important topics. Uh, depending on the size of the province's House of Assembly, there might be as few as 10 cabinet ministers uh, or as many as 30 cabinet ministers. In provincial political circles, the cabinet and the premier are collectively referred to as the executive council. Uh, it's worth noting here, though, that the cabinet ministers are generally dictated to by the premier in terms of policy. Because really, at the end of the day, the premier could just nix them all uh, and replace them with a more amicable minister while expending very little political capital. Uh, but such is the life of a provincial cabinet minister in Canada, I suppose. <laughs> in addition to the House of Assembly, uh, is old Queenie's representative the lieutenant governor. Uh, without getting into the nitty-gritty details, basically anything the House of Assembly wants to pass, the lieutenant governor needs to give, you guessed it, royal assent to. Uh, they pretty much always do. I can't think of an instance since the 40s that the Queen actually stepped in and told the provinces no. Uh, now, those of you who watch the federal government video are probably noticing something missing here. Uh, have you guessed what it is? 
Yeah, the Senate. So the provinces and territories have no quote unquote chamber of second sober second thought. So I guess us poor folk are allowed to make provincial decisions on our own. I don't know. Uh, but in all seriousness, though, you'll remember that the Senate is comprised of X number of senators from each province. So there's really just no need, uh, particularly given the limits on spending that the provinces have, uh, which we'll get to later. And thank goodness, too, because the senators can get really expensive. Uh, but to put it in terms that politicos will respect, this means that the federal Canadian government is bicameral, Latin for two houses, the upper house and the lower house, and the provincial governments are unicameral, uh, just the House of Assembly, so only one house. In theory, this makes things easier and quicker, uh, but not always. Either way, though, regardless of the number of houses, the provincial government, just like the federal, uh, is considered a constitutional monarchy. And the constitution is what defines the relationship between the feds and the provinces, which brings us to the next section, uh, division of powers. So before we get into this one too deep, keep in mind that the general consensus is that despite being founded on a principle of federalism, the Canadian government is largely considered decentralized. Uh, and that's for three primary reasons. First, the provinces control key social services like health, welfare, that sort of thing. Uh, the provinces have jurisdiction over civil and what few property rights we have. Uh, and the provinces control the local government, which means, by extension, property tax, city development, and basic infrastructure, so like roads, transport, that kind of thing. Okay, But like all things in Canadian politics, there's some Houdini-level misdirection going on that really empowers the feds. Uh, this division of powers is set out in the Constitution Act of 1982, by the way. So if you're looking for a good sleepy read, pick it up and read it. Uh, but I'll break down the key bits here for you so you don't have to drudge through all the legalese. So, the Constitution recognizes all the provinces we have currently as being quote-unquote autonomous, uh, which really just means that the feds can't step in and change their rules whenever they want. This is in contrast to the territories who are subordinate to the feds. So, if we want to change how their whole world works, the feds can just kind of do that if it's the territories, but they can't with the provinces. Uh, that same Constitution sets out the division of powers. There are three kinds, so stuff that is the sole purview of the feds, uh, stuff that is the exclusive purview of the provinces, and things they have basically joint custody of. So the provinces get a decent package here. Uh, they get anything of a local or private nature, which is suitably vague, uh, any direct taxation, any natural resources or crown land. Uh, crown land is any land owned by the monarch. Uh, nowadays, basically, it's just national parks. Uh, Health care and pretty much everything related to that. Uh, Co-ops and savings banks. Uh, administration of justice, which is why we have provincial courts, interprovince transport and business welfare, uh, education, and uh, quote unquote local works, which is another ill defined term which is used as a pretty decent catch all. Uh, so, not bad overall, but the feds come firing back with quite a few doozies of their own, and here's some of my favorites. So, any form of taxation, banking and currency, foreign affairs, which ironically includes relations with First Nations people. Uh, criminal law and penitentiaries, militia and defense, and the three all-time favorites, I get to do whatever I want items. Uh, anything in relation to peace, order, and good governance. So this is like the general welfare clause in the American Constitution, where if misinterpreted, grant supreme ultimate power to the feds. Uh, but in case it wasn't clear, uh, they also have declaratory powers, uh, that is to say, any quote-unquote work that is to the general advantage of Canada, and residuary powers, which is literally, if it's not codified in the Constitution as belonging to either the provinces or jointly owned, assume the feds have jurisdiction over it. Finally, the Constitution says that they get joint say over three things, immigration, agriculture, and pensions, but not old age pensions, those are the feds' sole purview. Uh, so in short, if it's not listed as being joint or provincially controlled, it's controlled by the feds. If there is doubt over who would get control over something, assume the feds get it. So when you hear all this spin about how the government of the current day is trying to centralize power in the federal government more than has ever been done before, let us set the record straight. These powers were laid out in the Constitution Act of 1982. And unless I magically somehow forgot my prime ministers, that puts the blame for centralized power at the feet of one prime minister, Elliot Trudeau, who was prime minister from 79 to 84. So love it or hate it, he's the guy that did it. But wait, it gets better, there's more. So aside from having limits on what they can legislate and the feds' ability to stop and take over provincial powers through the governor general, uh, there's one more thing that is super important when discussing provincial politics. And that, my friends, is the almighty dollar. 
at the end of the day, what a province can do is limited by money and the feds simply have more of it. And interestingly enough, there is no rules against the feds giving the provinces money and also no requirement for them to do so. Uh, what this does is creates a very powerful lever that the feds love to use. It, it works like this. So the provinces have a grand idea. Let's call it, for the sake of argument, healthcare. Okay? Problem is, they don't have the money they need. So they go to the feds and say, hey, Mr. Boss Man, sir, ma'am, could we have some money for this thingy we want to do? And the feds go, sure, kiddo, but you got to do it like this, with these stipulations, or no soup for you. And the provinces say, well, I'm not sure that no soup, say the feds. And eventually the provinces get in line. Uh, they do what they're told and they get their money. The most hotly contested piece of legislation like this is the Canada Health Act because uh, it needs billions of dollars from the feds to function. And so the feds have managed to get something akin to supreme ultimate power uh, over health care, even though it is strictly a provincial issue. Good old money. See, money talks and poorly written constitutions walk. That is the lesson learned from this, I suppose. All right, folks, so let's sum up. Provinces elect a number of MPPs to the General Assembly. The party with the most MPPs is given the mandate to govern, and the leader of that party becomes the premier of the province. The provinces are autonomous, so long as they don't want federal money or try to touch legislation not on their list, and the queen still has her royal scepter up in our business provincially. Uh, and that's pretty much it um, for today, folks. I hope I was able to dispel the fog of politics for you a little bit more. Uh, remember, keep yourself involved, folks. The future is pretty much counting on you in order to make sure we don't mess it all up. So you guys have yourself a great day, and I'll talk to you guys again later. I trade all day on our soul.